Remember to subscribe down below and like the video and share it on your Facebook and other social media. And then make a comment, whether a question or a comment. We read all of them and we try to respond to all. Today I want to talk with you about this word in the book of Revelation, the Apocalypse of John, and it's translated as beast. Now, I don't often focus on end-time topics or the book of Revelation, although I have been drawn to it uh, quite frequently in order to show Jesus' own words to rebuke those who follow heretical teachings in the church. Here is a word that is grossly mistranslated, and I want to draw attention to it because there's all kinds of hype around this word, and it's wrongly translated which means that this hype is wrong. I'm not saying there shouldn't be hype. I'm saying that the hype is wrong because it's about a mistranslated word into English. It's about the English word, the English idea, not about the Greek idea, the Greek word, which is completely different. We're going to see that here. And what I want to make you think about is this. Many, many, so-called Christians. They say, God told me this. God showed me this. God told me this. And it's about this misconception, this derived from a mistranslation, that has nothing to do with the real and actual end times. It has to do with this fabricated end times based on a mistranslation. And God, God does not make a mistake. God knows everything that's ever happened. He knows that someone mistranslated that word. And that does not accurately portray his own testimony. Remember, he is the one who wrote that testimony by the Holy Spirit through the writers of the Bible. And therefore, he knows what he wrote through them. He knows what was put there. He also knows those who mistranslated that word and cause all kinds of confusion for the ages in the church. So let's get into it. So the beast. I'm going to show you in the Greek, and then we're going to talk about the implications of this. So here what I've done is I've put the King James up here. King James. Under it I've got the Strong's numbers for those words. It's not a word for word, as you can see, as people assume. It's not far off from a word for word, but it's not a word for word. And then you've got also what's called the morphological tags, which down here tell us what part of speech, what part of the sentence this is. What What is it? A noun, preposition, verb, what kind of verb, right? What tense? What voice, what mood. So let's go ahead and have a look here. And here is the beast right here. This is Revelation 11, 7. And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. Now there are two beasts, remember, in the Bible, or in the uh, Apocalypse of John that are mentioned. But it doesn't matter, it's the same word. Let's go ahead and look at the the Strong's number. There are two numbers for this because it's the beast. First one is just the article the, and the second one here is the word for beast, Thurion. Now, Thurion is a diminutive from 2339, okay? And it says here a dangerous animal, but that's not accurate. So let's go ahead and have a look here. It's a diminutive. That means it's a, a it represents either a cute form or a little form, like lamb, right? A little lamb is called a lambkin. Maybe you didn't know that, but that's the English word for it, lambkin. And so the kin on the end makes it a cute little lamb, or a very small lamb. It's a diminutive, meaning making it smaller. So this is the original word that's made into a diminutive. And this word itself it looks like it means a wild animal as game, but it doesn't. It means hunting. So this word thura, a thera, comes from ther. Ther means a wild animal as game. 
a wild game animal. Thera is the act of hunting the wild game animal. And our original word, Thorion, you get it back up here, uh, Thorion, is a diminutive of that. A diminutive of it. A diminutive of hunting a wild game animal. So, you may ask yourself, what in the world? How do you get from, from A to B? This is a diminutive from the same as 2339. It says a dangerous animal. If it's a diminutive, it can't simply be a dangerous animal. And if it's from Thura, it is definitely not a dangerous animal. They're reading back into that, a dangerous animal. It is a, an animal for hunting, absolutely. But it's a diminutive of it. So, it's like a small hunted game animal. The small hunted game animal that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. Now when we think of the beast, we think of this terrifyingly crafty creature who is really, really scary and is going to eat you and tear you to shreds. It's going to be a very painful death. But this makes it different. It is a game animal. Who's going to be hunting this game animal? Who is it who comes back and destroys the beast? Think back in Sunday school. What was always, always the answer to any question? If you didn't know the answer. Jesus. Yeah. This is going to be a hunted game animal of Jesus. That's what we're looking at. Why does he want to put a mark on the back of your hand or your forehead? Well, we've talked about this before, right? So we can go into detail on that, uh, on that in a minute, but I want to give you a different perspective on it now. Now that we know what the beast is, it's not a beast. It's a cute little hunted game animal. It takes away that threat. But... What he's trying to do is mark you with his name, making you a hunted game animal as well. Turning you into a hunted game animal of Jesus Christ. When he comes back, he will hunt the hunted game animal and all other hunted game animals that bear the same name. That's the trick. That's what he's trying to do. So, the question is, how do you stop that from happening? Now that we know what, what that word really means in the English, it doesn't mean beast. It doesn't mean beast. It's a diminutive of a hunted game animal. That name that goes on the back of the hand or the forehead, we've talked about it before, you can go back to the Shema Israel in Deuteronomy uh, 6, and it talks about binding God's words to the back of the hand and to the forehead. That's the first place those two are mentioned. And that represents the actions being guided by the words of God and the perspective and the thought life being guided by the words of God. And so when we see that the hunted game animal wants to brand you with his name, he doesn't care whether it's the back of the hand or the forehead. He doesn't care, either one. If he gets one of those, then God's words cannot guide that, and so we are not complete. If he is able to brand your actions... So that your actions reflect that you are a hunted game animal of God. And not a child of God. He's got you. If he can't get that, but he gets your perspective and your, your thought life, and he brands that as a hunted game animal of God, he's got you. You're not a child of God then. 
you're a hunted game animal and you're thinking that way. How can I outwit God? How can I trick God into forgiving me again? That kind of thought is a hunted game animal. How can I trick God into forgiving me again? I know he wouldn't if he knew my real thoughts about this. I'm terrified that I'm going to commit this sin again. Because I know I will. But I need to be forgiven because I know I will be punished eternally if I don't. If I don't receive forgiveness. And I can't receive forgiveness unless I'm repentant. I know I have to be repentant, but I don't feel repentant. I actually love the pleasure of that sin. One man came to me here on the channel and said that. He says, I know that I must repent because I know that if I don't, I will be punished eternally. And yet I don't feel repentant. And I actually love the sin that I'm involved in. But I know that I must repent. What can you do? Well, you have two options. Well, three, really. You can just continue what you're doing and take the punishment. You can break yourself on the rock, which is Jesus Christ. Humble yourself. Break yourself until you, until you allow God to break through and convict you of that sin and have true repentance. And it may take a day. It may take months. And it may take years. It may take the rest of your life, but at least you will have achieved it. The other alternative is to trick yourself. Try to trick God. Then you're behaving as a hunted game animal trying to outwit the hunter because you are hunted because you're not forgiven and you refuse to start walking in the light therefore you're still a hunted game animal you are the beast are you terrified yet? you should be it's terrifying. It's very terrifying. You must stop sinning. You must stop sinning. And if you feel like you can't stop sinning, it's not a problem with God. God didn't rig the system. God didn't make you so that you have to sin as long as you're in the flesh and the body as they say, the heretics, making excuses for sin. It's no excuse. God won't accept it. If you feel like you can't stop sinning, the problem is not with God. The problem is with you. What are you going to do about it? What are you going to do about it? Here's a passage from Paul in 1 Corinthians 9.27. Let's look at the second one, which is a common English translation of the rooted word. But I am giving a black eye to my body. And I am leading it as a slave. That I may not come to be rejected somehow while proclaiming to others. But I am giving a black eye to my body. Pow. And I am leading it as a slave that I may not come to be rejected somehow while proclaiming to others. He is forcing his body to obey God. You're not repentant. You don't feel repentance. Break yourself. Because without humility, you will never receive the grace of God. And without the grace of God, you cannot be saved.
because it's the cheerful graciousness of God, literally. You must break yourself. You must break yourself in humility and wait on God to give you the cheerful graciousness. Humble yourselves under God's mighty hand that he may lift you up in due time. The cheerful graciousness that lifts you up. So you have a choice today. Now that you know what that creature is, that it's a hunted game animal, and it's nothing in comparison to Christ the hunter, that's why it's a diminutive. It's trivialized, and yet it does some pretty nasty damage to the human race. But it's a hunted game animal, and you have a choice today. You can either give in and be branded a hunted game animal for Christ to pursue and hunt down and kill. Be thrown into the lake of burning sulfur, the place prepared for the devil and his angels and the beast and the false prophet where the smoke of their torment rises forever and ever. That's one choice. Where you think you are your own authority. There is no authority over you. And sometimes that comes in the form of, I have a direct connection with God, and God's speaking to me all the time, and no one can tell me anything different. These dreamers, these people who vomit visions, they're all over YouTube. They crawled out like cockroaches out of the crevices of the earth. And they're all on YouTube. It's an abomination. That they are marked with the mark of the beast and they don't even know it. They pretend to be Christian. They call themselves Christian. But they're marked with the beast. The hunted game animal. They're marked as a hunted game animal because they put themselves above everything else. And sometimes, it, like I said, they do this clandestinely by saying, oh, God revealed this to me. And if you try to challenge them on it and say, well, hold on a minute, that doesn't jive with, with Scripture. Oh, you can't tell me that. God told me this, and I'm not going to even listen to you because you are definitely not of God because you're trying to oppose what God told me. It's this kind of uh, an argument, see? This is the mark of the hunted game animal on them. Six, six, six. Six is the number of man. It says so in the passage. And there are three of them. And three is divinity. God. This is man in God's place. The trinity of man. It's putting man in the place of God. Replacing every member of the trinity with man. You're putting yourself in God's place, supplanting God. That's the mark of the hunted game animal. That's what brands you as a hunted game animal. Christ will hunt you down. And at that point, he will show no mercy. Do you want that? You can go party, go have fun right now. And in the end, be hunted down. Not only hunted down, but you will be cast into the burning lake of sulfur. If you go back and read and watch this video where I talked about the apocalypse of Peter and it described the terrifying torment. Why I read the descriptions of, of the terrifying torment that Peter goes into great detail to describe. You say apocalypse of Peter. That's not part of the Bible. It was. It was part of the Bible before the imperial church established what's called the canon. And they mistakenly put out the apocalypse of Peter out of the canon. It was accepted by all the churches. 
It just fell out of favor to read during the congregational times because it's very graphic. But that doesn't mean that they rejected it. They didn't reject it. It was commonly held across all the churches as divinely inspired scripture that Peter wrote. So I'll try to get that video up here, and, uh, up here, and you can go ahead and have a look at it. You can listen to it. It's terrifying. Do you want to be in that position where you have these horrifying torments that you suffer forever? It's irrevocable. It's an irrevocable judgment on you. Or do you want to escape this? Escape the wrath of God? Be the hunter instead of the hunted. Which would you rather be? Would you rather be hunting alongside Christ? Or would you rather be hunted by Christ? And the whole host of heaven. I know which side I want to be on. I know which side I am on. And I'm staying on this side. I am going to be one of the hunters alongside Christ. If he calls on me to do that. But I will not be the hunted. I will not. Because I follow the word of God, which is Jesus Christ. I listen to the testimony of God and I obey God. If you love me, you will obey my commandments, plural. My commandments, plural. Jesus said, if you love me, you will obey my commandments. If you say you love Christ, but you don't obey his commandments, you're a liar. You don't love him. You love the idea of him. You love qualities that you imagine about him, whether they're true or not. But you do not actually love him if you do not obey his commandments. And I can guarantee you have no part of the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit is not a spirit of lawlessness. The Holy Spirit is not a spirit of uncleanness. Hence, holy. Terrifyingly clean. That's what the word means, hagios. The Holy Spirit is the terrifyingly clean Spirit of God. And if you are not purifying yourself, if you are not living a holy life, do you have any part to do with the Holy Spirit of God, the terrifyingly clean Spirit of God, if you're not becoming terrifyingly clean yourself? Be holy because I am holy. In other words, be terrifyingly clean. Because I am terrifyingly clean. Peter's quoting God. We must avoid becoming the hunt, the hunted game animal. We will be helpless before Christ and we will be punished. And there will be no recourse. We can't say, oh, but I was tricked. No. Because when you stand before the Almighty God for judgment, he will pull up all the signposts of testimonies in your life that he put there by messengers like myself who have testified before you the truth of God. I'm planting one right now, right here. You see it? You hear it? This is the testimony of truth from God. And I'm the messenger who's planting it in your life. And when you face the Almighty God, you have to give account for that testimony. If you chose not to obey those testimonies, he will pull those signposts up and, and show them to you and say, these condemn you. But if you listen to those testimonies at any point in your life, but you don't know how long you've got, but you listen to those testimonies and you, and you respond, because those are testimonies from God. And you do what's right. And you stop sinning. And you do what's right. Then when you stand in front of the Almighty God, 
He will pull those testimonies up and he will show you and say, well done. Well done. Pass to eternal life, you righteous one. Don't you want that to be the words of God to you? Don't you want that to be the words of the Father, of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, to you when you stand before him in his mighty splendor? In all his glory, you're going to stand before him trembling and terrified. And he's going to say, well done. Well done, you who are righteous. Go to eternal life and I'll see you there. May the Lord bless you as you seek him with all your heart. Remember to subscribe down below and like the video and share it on your Facebook and other social media. And then make a comment, whether a question or a comment. We read all of them and we try to respond to all. Get on over to our website, The Rooted Word, and start reading the translation and also the articles we've posted. It's at therootedword.com, therootedword.com. And may the Lord bless you as you seek him with all your heart.